Happy Friday. Welcome to another episode of Xerox Office Hours. Today we're going to be doing some hands-on development uh, on the new production health checking canary infrastructure. So what that's all about is providing some built-in tooling to help manage the performance of uh, production environments like production Xerox instances. Um, there already has been some tooling built into Xerox. Um, if you do a Xerox test, there's a tier, Xerox test loopback. So you can do Xerox test loopback and there's a public underneath there. Start a loop to agent testing public proxy shares. So I already kind of re retooled that code a little bit uh, in the new, to, to be the, the start of the new production health checking infrastructure. Um, we're gonna probably go ahead and, and add another chunk of that. Uh, and I'll, and we'll, we'll take a look at what it looks like. So to get, we'll just jump right in. To get started, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go into the CLI package, which is command Xerox. And we're gonna go ahead and get rid of the test loop public that's there. So we'll get rid of all of the test loop stuff entirely. So we don't need this anymore because it's been ported. Um, so now we can go into main and let's also get rid of anything here about test loop. Test, yeah, test loop, we don't need that anymore. Don't need that anymore. I think that's it. So if we do a go install, we do a Xerox test, there shouldn't be a loop anymore, yeah. Uh, so there's always been, in case you don't know this, there's always been a Xerox test endpoint which runs on port 9191, I believe. And if you hit it with curl, uh, was it 99? No, it's 9090 maybe. Yeah, yeah. So there's always been a test endpoint. Um, if we hit that with a web browser, and this is outside of the scope of this video, but just while we're looking at stuff, um, it's just a test endpoint. So if you ever need, just a simple HTTP server to, to uh, use for testing. There's one built into Xerox. Um, it's just a regular old HTTP endpoint, nothing fancy. So that's there. Uh, and there's also an old WebSocket test that's in here. I kind of think maybe we should get rid of that too while we're cleaning stuff up. Yeah, let's do that. So we'll get rid of that test WebSocket. Uh, let's delete that. Um, yeah, so now if we do a rebuild. Okay, so now, now there's just the endpoint and the canary commands. So if we do Xerox test canary, right now there's a canary periodic. And the, the idea with the, this whole production health checking canary we the the current Xerox production environment at Xerox IO that we have some internal uh, canary infrastructure that we've sort of already just rolled within the production ops side of the house um, just to do some basic health checking and performance monitoring. The stuff that I'm working on now inside of Xerox proper will go a little further than that. So we're going to end up having if I pull the card back up, I actually have some notes in here. Uh, enable loop disable. So there's going to be some. Um, different kinds of testing. So you can think of it almost like a end-to-end a, a -end system integration testing. Um, it's gonna do also do some performance management, so timing metrics with success thresholds. So we'll, we'll be able to start like automatically failing tests if uh, performance goes down. Uh, we'll do some longevity testing with persistent reserve shares, uh, API timing, that sort of stuff. But to kind of get this effort started, I just took the, the existing public loop infrastructure and ported it over into the new Canary package and sort of retooled it. That was very old code. That was old code that I wrote when uh, I first started working on Xerox. I think I think I wrote that during the Xerox 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 time period. So it's very old and kind of needed to be needed a facelift anyway. So I went ahead and I, and I and I updated it to the new the new latest standards using the SDK and some of that sort of stuff. So if we take a look at it. Um, what I refer to as a looper, you might think of like a load test or uh, concurrency testing, that sort of stuff. A looper, if we 
look at what a looper does. So I've, and, I, and I, I'm expecting to have multiple different kinds of loopers. Right now I've got a public HTTP looper. Um, I think what we're gonna add today is a private HTTP looper as a, and we'll, we might take this code and start refactoring some of the commonality of those things out because we're probably gonna end up with different kinds of loopback tests. We'll probably have, um, you know, testing for TCP UDP, uh, do some drive testing, some other types of uh, shares we'll end up having other other loopback tests for. But this is this public HTTP looper is designed to do a simple set of uh, concurrency and correctness testing for a public proxy endpoint. That's all it does. So basically, I've got this thing called a public HTTP looper. They all have an ID. You can pick a public front end. Uh, it's got this sort of generalized looper option structure, which lives inside this package. And we'll go over that in a minute. Um, typical ENV core root. So you need to have an enabled environment for this. Uh, it creates a share. So it actually uses the SDK to create a share. It creates a listener. So we actually go ahead and stand up an HTTP server as part of this. Um, it's got some control infrastructure around aborting and, and marketing and joining with it when it's done. And then it stores uh, results in a result structure, which I expect to also be common among all of the different loopers. So it's got a start time, stop time, number of loops, number of errors, number of mismatches, bytes, etc. cetera. Uh, and then there's a, a summarization tool here that will actually allow you to summarize the results for multiple loopers. Um, as far as the options go, again, these loopers are meant to sort of be used in parallel. So they, you can, and they're, they're meant to run a number of iterations so you can pick the number of iterations for the loopers, uh, the number of iterations that it will report status. So I think the default is 100, uh, what the timeout is. So if, if the, the thing you're connecting to, whatever your timeout threshold is, the minimum maximum payload sizes, if those are set to the same value, then you'll get whatever that, that number is. If there's a delta between them, it will generate a random payload size between those two numbers. Um, there's a dwell time, so once the, uh, looper creates its share and binds its listener, the dwell time will wait before it sends the first request to it. Um, I think it's set to set to one second or none by default. I can't remember which, but I think it might be, it might be zero. Um, and the same thing with the min and max there, you, you pass a duration and it will, will generate, if, if they're the same value, it will use that value. If there's a delta between them, it will generate a random duration between those two uh, boundaries. Same thing with pacing. So pacing is, how, what, what the delay is between requests. Um, so those are all the sort of options at this point. So it's a, you can see it's a very minimal uh, sort of load testing framework. Um, I'll go back to the actual public HTTP looper implementation. Typical new function generates the, uh, in, initializes the looper. You pass it the ID, which is a, a uint, uh, the front end selection, whatever looper options, and you pass it the uh, environment core root. And then once you've created it, you can go ahead and run it. And it's meant to sort of be uh, uh, assigned to a single Go routine. So once that when this starts up, I can get rid of this defer. That was there for some debugging I was doing earlier. Um, you can see that it, it defers a close of the done channel. And that's used again to join when you've got multiple Go routines to figure out when they're all, they've all successfully completed. So when this, this function exits, it will uh, defer closing that, that channel. Um, and it will also defer a log message saying that it's stopping. And then once it's, when it starts up, it, it uh, mentions that it's starting. And I, I'm kind of standardizing these log messages on this format where I've got number and then the ID. So you can see I'm using the ID here. And that's just, uh, I, I tend to like log messages to try and be as visually consistent as I can when I'm doing stuff like this. So go ahead and we, we do these things and then we're, we're gonna run this startup function. Startup will go ahead and create a share. So it uses the, the Xerox SDK to create a share. Uh, it's a public share with the proxy backend mode. The target, when you create your own listener, the target in any, any type of share is sort of a loose contract between whatever the backend is that's consuming that, that's, that's uh, providing the backend for that share. The target is what it needs to connect to and that's uh, pass through Xerox itself in this case. And it's also shown in like the, the Xerox console, which is part of why I've set it to something meaningful at all. It could be empty because my uh, infrastructure to, to actually bind the listener doesn't care about the target. So it's purely just there for looks. Um, and then we're, we're, I've designed this public HTTP looper to use a single front end. One thing that I don't know that a lot of people know about in Xerox, it's currently set up that you can have as many public front ends as you want. You can create 
and public front ends. And those are usually created and managed by whoever is running that service instance. In the case of the Xerox IO uh, instance, we currently only have one called public, which is the default. And that's using GeoDNS and a bunch of things like that. And it's ge geographically distributed. But you can set up multiple public front ends. They might have different DNS. They might have different locality. Um, but this public HTTP looper is set up to only use a single public front end. So when you create a share, like if we go look at Xerox share public, you can specify front end multiple times. You can see it defaults to public. Um, you can specify front end multiple. So you can do Xerox share public, front end, my front end, front end, public. You can add as many front ends as you have uh, and it will generate n urls one for each of the front ends you specify so that's why some of these things are string arrays but for this looper we're going to only this is set up to only test a single public front end um create the share and that's basically all startup does is it, go, it creates the share if we go back to run we do our startup then we bind our listener so when we bind our listener uh we use the zd identity inside the enabled uh xerox root so when you uh, enable a Xerox environment, one of the things that, that's done is it, it creates a ZD identity for that environment. And that identity is what's uh, used to make policy decisions and control who's allowed to access what inside the Xerox network. So by default, when you enable that environment, you've always got a public identity, or you got an identity. We're using that, that environment identity. Um, and then ZD.newconfig from file, that reads the identity JSON, which has all of the uh, pointers to the ZD infrastructure and those sorts of things and all the cryptography components that it needs. Uh, and it generates this config object. So then we're using it, creating a ZD listen object options, setting the connect timeout to five minutes, uh, creating a new ZD context, which is uh, sort of the, the core of a, a, a ZD SDK connection. Uh, and then we're doing a listen. So we're doing listen with options. And that takes, by default, it takes a na service name. We use the share, our, our share token is our service name. And then we're passing it that options that we set up before. And then from there, we're basically doing HTTP serve, which is part of the Go standard library. We're passing it our listener that's our, our ZD listener. So this is basically using the uh, identity and credentials inside the enabled Xerox directory to create a listener on the ZD network. Um, that listener is basically, it's an edge con, I believe. Yeah. Edge listener, uh, which is conforms to the net dot listener. So we're basically passing that into HTTP serve. So that's one of the nice things about the ZD SDK, um, is that it, it, if you're doing go specifically, all these things plug and play with all of the standard library networking components. So you can incorporate uh, secure ZD overlay comms directly into your application really, really seamlessly. So we're kicking off our HTTP serve in a, in a uh, anonymous uh, Go routine. And if it has an error, it will report that. So when then once we've bound our listener, then we do our dwell time. So that's basically, if you've set dwell in your configuration, it will um, wait that amount of time. And then from there, we start our iteration. So iterate, that's where all of the heavy lifting happens. So we, we log our, we, we keep track of our start time. We defer our, uh, recording our stop time. And then we basically have a giant for loop that's the number of iterations. And while it's not aborted, um, if it's an iteration that's a status inter interval, then it will go ahead and report you know, what, what iteration we're on. Um, and then it generates a random payload. So the payload size is computed off of uh, the difference between the min and the max. So the delta, if there's delta that's bigger than zero, generates a random payload of that in that size range. Otherwise, uh, and then it base64 encodes it. Um, from there, we're basically just doing a simple post. So we're doing an HTTP post and uh, creating an HTTP client, giving it our timeout, uh, telling it to do our request, checking the status code, recording errors, uh, pulling in the payload. So basically, it's an echo server. Uh, if we look at the um, when we do we did our our bind, yeah, if we did our bind listener, did we skip that? We may have skipped that. So the fun thing about Xerox office hours is I always do these on Fridays and sometimes I'm a little tired. So hopefully that's uh, more, more entertaining than anything for, for, for anyone who's watching this. We did a bind listener and we, we talked about that. Yeah, we did talk about that. Um, 
what was I going with that? I had a side tangent related to that. Oh, so this, yes, this serve HTTP is related to this bind listener function. So basically when we do our, our HTTP serve, we're giving it our edge connection, but we're, then we're giving it, that takes the second parameter is the handler, which is part of the, the Go standard library. We're actually saying the looper itself is our handler. So it needs to have this, and that's an interface, um, and it needs to have this function in order to satisfy the interface. So all this is doing is reading in whatever uh, data was requested or sent in in the request and writing it back out. So it's effectively an echo server. And in this case, we're not uh, keeping track of errors or short writes or anything like that. It's kind of irrelevant because the looper itself is doing the client side is doing correctness testing. So if for some reason you don't get complete data or there's an error or something like that, the client will record it. So it's not really much use in, in tracking errors in this, this function itself. So that, that was my side tangent. Um, I wanted to talk about how it was an echo server. So we do our dwell, do our iterate. Um, yeah, so basically we send our, we post our payload to it. Um, we check to see if we get back a 200. If we don't, we record an error, but we don't abort processing. Um, and then we pull in the, the we copy in the uh, in payload, which is base64 encoded. And basically if the, if the in base64 and out base64 don't match, we record a mismatch. Um, and that's the primary thing we're looking for. So we're, every time we, g we generate a random payload, we are expecting that we're gonna get back the full thing, that it's complete and it's the, uh, the integrity is, is, we get every byte we sent basically. Um, if they don't match, if they, if they don't match, we record an error. If they do match, we record the number of bytes. Uh, and that's basically it. If for whatever reason, the uh, client.do fails, we record an error. And if for whatever reason, generating the request doesn't work, record an error. And then once we, so basically this, this whole block generates a, a, a random payload and then uh, generates a request with that payload. And um, from there, we, after we, we, we send and, and validate that we got back what we sent, we have a pacing milliseconds, which basically, if there's a delta between the min and max pacing, we uh, sleep for the, a random time between those two boundaries. And then we record the, next, the loop. Shutting it down, so the next thing that happens after, after the looper does its iteration is we do a shutdown. And shutting it down is a matter of closing the listener and then deleting the share with the SDK. So that's really all it's doing. So it's basically a nice little convenience wrapper that generates a public share using the proxy backend mode, uh, instantiates a listener for that share using the ZD SDK and the Xerox SDK. So the Xerox SDK is just a wrapper around the ZD SDK that provides the opinionated Xerox environment details into that ZD SDK. It makes it, makes it a little simpler to use. Um, so we're basically uh, using that to just send some number of random payloads and uh, control pacing for those random payloads. So if we go in and look at the, um, let's go into the test canary periodic. This is the Cobra implementation for it. You can see there's a bunch of command line parameters for controlling the number of loopers, number of iterations, the status interval, uh, what the timeout should be, min and max payload, min and max dwell, min and max pacing. Um, and then we, the run function is sort of the business logic of this. We load our environment, make sure it's enabled. Uh, and then we create our loopers and we're basically using those command line parameters to initialize the looper options. So we create a new public HTTP looper. Uh, we append those into an array and we, every, for every single one that we create, we go ahead and start it up. And then there's a signal handler, just like a lot of the Xerox CLI stuff. If you've got a long uh, canary run running and you want to kill it because it's you configured to be too big or something. Uh, it's got a signal handler that, that iterates over the loopers and has them all abort and will join with them basically. Uh, these are actually independent. So this signal handler will, will abort them all. But once you've created all loopers and ran them, it's basically looping over joining with them, which this done uh, channel will uh, clo be closed if they've completed successfully or they've been aborted. So either way, we're joining with all those loopers. And then once all the loopers are done, we're doing a uh, canary report looper results <clears throat> and then report doing OS exit zero. This is redundant. It will report zero by default, but I don't know if it's, it was, was there before. And I kind of like, I kind of like reminding that uh, zero is the, you know, 
successful status at that point in the code. There were also some logris fatal uh, log messages. Those will uh, exit with a, a status code of one. So if we run these, and this is my traditional, if you've been here before, you've seen this, this is my traditional development environment. So if we stop all these things, what I'm doing with this environment, let's clean this up a little bit. This window is my Xerox controller. This window, and I'm not sure what's going on with these uh, metrics errors. There's something going on with metrics I need to take a look at. We'll just ignore these for now because we don't really care about metrics at the moment, but something's going on with my environment that I need to investigate. Um, this is the metrics bridge, which tails a uh, log of activity from ZD itself and pu publishes that onto an AMQP queue, which is picked up by the Xerox controller for metrics purposes. And so it's basically my controller, the metrics bridge, and then here I run a public front end and that's configured to basically just use my DNS uh, and its identity is public. So what that lets us do is we can do a Xerox share public backend mode web dot, right? And then we can grab this URL and do a curl with it, right? And we can get requests through it. So basic sharing, I've got an enabled environment, it's all working. So what we're gonna do now is let's run our canary. So we do Xerox test canary uh, periodic. And I might, we might actually rename this from periodic to just public HTTP for now, uh, because this is, uh, we're gonna end up with sort of a, at some point, a bigger suite, a command like periodic would run public HTTP, private HTTP, run a whole battery of periodic things that are meant to be run on a schedule. Uh, there'll be other types of canaries that basically start up a long running share and periodically send data to it, making sure that it's running. So there'll be some like a canary long longevity. There'll be some other types of canaries in here, but this, this one for now is just the public HTTP. So if you run it with no options, it's gonna do one iteration and basically uh, validate that the results came, it, it got what it sent. So you can see that it started the first looper, allocated a share, um, started the HTTP listener. And you, this error is actually an ignorable error. What's happening there is when the, when the looper is done, it's calling listener.close. So if we go into canary during shutdown, it's calling listener.close right here. And that's what this, that's where this error message is coming from. Um, it should really, does that show up as a shutdown message? No, it's a, it's the function itself. Um, yeah, it's because it's it's running. It's, it's the go routine function that we create when we do the bind the service listener. Um, let's leave the error message alone. It's fine for now. But yeah, that's that's happening because the listener is being closed. So what's happening is the this function right here is this serve is exiting with an error, which is why it's uh, let's change that. All right. So if we do a go install, I don't like the fact that it says starting because it's not actually starting it there. I know why that ended up there, but yeah. So all that's saying is that something closed the listener out from underneath this go routine, which is expected, expected behavior. Um, you can see we're not tracking a, a, an error there because it's not actually an error in that case. If for some reason this listener didn't start, it would uh, all of the iterations would fail with an error? They wouldn't be able to connect to anything. So that would that would basically that error would bubble up in another part of the stack. So um, that's basically what it does, and it keeps track of the rate and all that sort of stuff out of the box. So we could do help here, and then let's do just for fun. Let's go through some of the options. We could do uh, iterations five, right? So now it did five loops, different rate. Uh, might be nice to track the total amount of data that was, we should probably log that as well. In fact, let's do that. So if we go into our looper, we'll say, so actually we don't want that to be Let's do this. I've got, I'll, I'll show you something interesting. So if we go, this is after loops. 
So we'll do util bytes to size, and then we'll do int 64, um, and then it's results.bytes, right? Is it results. Dot, dot bytes, right? And then we'll do same thing here. So we'll do uh, util bytes to size int 64, and this is total x for, right? So now if we do this again, so we transferred, why are those numbers different? The util bytes to size basically Ports, uh, well, you can give it a number of bytes and it will automatically give you gigabytes, bytes, kilobytes, megabytes. It'll, it'll do that and, and, and format it in a pretty way for you. Um, but now we need to figure out why those are different. Total X for plus equals X for... There's only one result here. X for, what is that? Oh, that's, yeah. Oh, that's a rate. That's, that's a rate. Yeah, we're already doing total X for here, so it shouldn't be total X for. We need to keep track of that's a rate. So let's let's fix that so it's actually a rate. So what's happening is, and again, this is code that I'm freshening up that I wrote a long time ago. Um, this is computing the, the transfer rate by taking the, the number of bytes that looper and dividing it by the number of seconds to get the the rate per uh, the time period basically. Um, we can get rid of this because that's a little confusing, right? So we'll just say util bytes to size, and then we'll say uh, x for rate, right? And that should be int 64, right? That, that reads a little clearer to me. Let's get rid of that because that's really just util bytes size and we'll say total x for rate also int 64. I probably should change the signature of this to be uint64 but we'll leave it alone for the moment. It's, used, it's not just used in the canary, canary code, it's used elsewhere in the Xerox stack. Um, and then what we need to do is keep track of total bytes equals you went 64 zero. And then we need to say, total bytes plus equals result bytes. Cause we want to keep track of the total amount of data transfer across all of the loopers. So this is, this being a, loop over the results of each looper, we want to add up all of the data. So what we really want here is total bytes. So that should give us what we're looking for. Let's run this again. And now we've got the same amount of bytes and the same rate, 276.8, 276.8. All right, so that makes sense. So now if we run five iterations and two loopers, so now we should get a total of 10 loops, five per five iterations per looper, two loopers. So let's see if that happens. Great. So now we've got 28.1 plus 30, that, that's correct, so 65.7. 
I'm sh there's some rounding there for sure. Um, yeah, because the number of bytes, yeah, that makes sense. And then 189 186.9, 387.3, 574.2. Um, and you have to keep in mind that every time you run this, you're probably going to get different rates and things because it's generating random payloads and random payload sizes. So, in fact, now what we could do is ask for help again. Let's add a min dwell of, I don't know, five seconds, max dwell of five seconds. So it'll dwell for five seconds. Um, so you can see I, it start, it created the two loopers. Now it's dwelling for five seconds and then it runs. If we set this to 10 seconds, we, you'll, you'll probably, we'll probably see a staggered start because each looper will compute its own random dwell time. Probably could have used this shorter. Yeah, see, they they they, complete, they started one after the other with that with that random dwell time. Um, but we'll leave that alone. We'll just set min dwell to zero, max dwell to zero. Um, what's the default on that? It might be zero. One second. So it's got a dwell a min and max dwell time of one second. Um, which is fine. We don't need to mess with that. We can do uh, min payload. We'll say 102400 and we'll say max payload 102400. So we'll use some significantly larger payloads. Um, now we transferred much more data. We did 80K here, uh, 7.2 megabytes here. So then let's go ahead and try increasing our, um, let's do what the minimax pacing time, I think this is set to zero. Uh, the min pacing time. Yeah, they're both set to zero. So let's add some pacing. So let's do min pacing, two seconds, max pacing, five seconds. So now what'll happen is between requests, we will wait and let's kill that. So our, looks like our, yep, our shutdown code's working correctly. So now let's do, um, uh, what was it? Status interval. So we'll do uppercase S and it's going to be one every, so now we'll see in order to see that pacing because it's so long, we'll, uh, set it to one second, one iteration reporting the status. Yep, looks good. So we're not getting any mismatches, no errors. Um, if we do something silly, like let's say, let's do 50 iterations and we'll do 24 loopers. So we'll, we'll significantly scale up the, the, the load. We'll probably get some mismatches because at some point, um, there's a threshold that's hit in my ZD configuration. You can see the, the public front end, all the requests coming through down here. We are getting metrics data. This, this share circuit that that is metrics handler. This is, this is the metrics bridge sending metrics data. So metrics is working. I might just need to delete my temp directory for, for my ZD network underneath this. Fortunately, 99.9% .9 of the time I run my, uh, ZD infrastructure and I leave it just sitting there. I never even look at it. It's running in Docker. Never look at it. It just works. Oh, error in HTTP listener. So something happened. Yep, another error. Oh, that's the shutdown. So we're getting to the end of the run. We'll see what happened. So we've still got that pacing in there, which is causing every single request to sort of be spread out a little bit. We'll see what happens if we start eliminating that pacing. So 1,200 loops total. So 50 loops per... 50 loops, 24 loopers, 
uh, transferred almost coming up on a gigabyte. Uh, no mismatches, no errors at 10.3 megabytes a second. So let's go ahead and get rid of, let's change this to 10 iterations, get rid of the pacing, and then we'll set this to be even bigger by on the small end. And no errors, yep. 396.3 megabytes per second. Let's uh, change this to be, let's get rid of that, leave it at 100. So let's do 100 iterations and we'll do 32 loopers now. Clearly, you also have to have high limits in order to do this. Already seeing payload mismatches. Or no, I think I saw one. One mismatches. 1.9 gigabyte, 315 megabytes a second. You can see all the individual looper rates. Let's go real big. Let's go to 64 loopers. It might also be smart to have a, um, and maybe we'll add this. We'll just, we'll, maybe we'll do this right now. Let's add a, uh, new pacing value where we control how quickly new loopers are added. Three mismatches. Looks like a couple of these loopers had mismatches. And that's another thing that I want to add with uh, this new this new performance management framework. Because I want to, whenever there's a mismatch, I want to see what the data sent and received was. Maybe write it to a file or something like that so we can actually kind of do some analysis on what's going on. But you can see 404 megabytes a second. Um, let's go, let's make this even bigger. Let's do 4096. And the other thing that, that might be smart to do this time too, um, we're basically running the crypto random stuff in the process of doing this work. It might be smart for each looper to generate a block of data up to the maximum uh, payload size at the start and then just use random uh, references through that through that uh, data rather than regenerating new data every time because that ends up generating a bunch of CPU load to do that. Um, so we got a couple things we can play with here. Okay, so what have we changed so far? Let's go ahead and see. Again, you have to bear with me. It's been a long week and uh, my brain, as usual, isn't quite as sharp as it might have otherwise been. So we, we cleaned up some things in the looper results, the, the reporter. So we fixed some rates and things, which is good. That needed to be done. Um, we changed. We got rid of that defer. I had a bug earlier today where I forgot to set the opt, the looper options in the looper structure itself. So this uh, go routine that get th this... One of the go routines, I think it was because whenever, whoever called this run function, because if you go back to the um, test canary periodic, here we're doing go looper run. Each one of those loopers was was erroring and I wasn't able to see the, the, what was going on. So I did a recover. It was a little hack I did to figure out what was going on. Um, got rid of the loop command. That's good. We got rid of the uh, web socket and then we added a lot. Yes, I just added some white space. So let's go ahead and commit that. I'm, I'm, I tend to like to commit early and often. Um, number 771 was, uh, this guy. So push that. So now let's add, let's let's do what we were talk, what I was talking about a minute ago and let's add in our looper, we'll add a new option. Um, and that's not really part of this, it's part of the, and this might be one of those things that we move around in time 
But what we're really going to do is we're going to come into test canary periodic and we're going to add a new, um, we'll say, what do we want to call that? We'll call it pre-delay. As a musician, I kind of like the concept of pre-delay. So we'll say min pre-delay. Time duration, it's pre-delay, time duration. And then we'll add, and that was after minimax payload. So what we want is we're going to use this to control how quickly we create loopers. Currently, it creates them as fast as it possibly can, but we might want it in some cases to. Um, and what if you're doing a large number of them? Every looper that you're running, depending on the dwell time, might be already sending traffic through the network. We might want to s more slowly add loopers as that tra as things are ramping up. So. This might be useful for that. It might be something we want to do on a slope in time. I don't know, but for, for now, we'll just uh, do this. It's pretty delay. Is there a maximum pre delay before creating the next looper? And then what we'll do. There might be a more effective way to do that, but I know that works. If pre delay delta is greater than zero, then we want to do a delay equals rand dot uh, int n pre delay. Yeah, the delta. Hang on, what did I do? Yes, math rand. Yes. Plus, so basically, we want to we want a random number of the delta time plus the the uh, min pre delay. So what's we got casting to do? Oh, and we want that to be um, times time at millisecond. Wow, I am having a slow day today. Let's try this again. So we do rand int n. Yes, pre delay delta. Plus command min pre delay, right? Let's see time dot millisecond. That should fix it. Oh, 
Oh, it's because it's in milliseconds already. Um, wow. Okay. I'm losing my mind. Now I've got int and 64. So this needs to be int 64. Right? What am, what am I? That returns int 64, and this returns int, and pre delay is. Yes. All right. And then if there is a pre delay, we want to do a time sleep. Uh, yes. Beautiful. Thank you, Jeff Rains AI. All right. So, and that, and just to make sure, we set that pre delay to zero. All right. So now what we can do, let's go back to our. I don't know why that was so hard for me today. I feel like in every single one of these Xerox Office Hours videos, I do something stupid. And when I do something stupid, hopefully it's at least mildly entertaining for anyone who's watching. All right, so now we can do, so we won't, we're, we're, let's, let's run even more. And we'll say min pacing two seconds, max pacing five seconds. So we'll have some pacing between every request for these 128 loopers. And then we'll do min pre delay two seconds, max pre delay five seconds. So that's also going to pace how qu quickly we add the loopers. So we'll see what that does. You can see the requests are flowing through. Let's keep track of our what's going on CPU wise also while we're doing this. Requests are definitely ramping up. You can see the traffic flowing through. The uh, metrics data is coming into the Xerox controller. Might also be nice at some point to report, uh, rather than waiting till the end to do a full report of results, might be kind of nice to have some interim reports so we can at least see rates and things and success criteria. I suspect that this will probably be the first of a handful of videos about these things. So it looks like we're already up to like 45 minutes or something. So I might uh, do this and maybe we'll do the, maybe we'll try and do the uh, crypto uh, once rather than doing it on every single iteration. Maybe we'll try and do that too, to make it a little extra long do that and call that a video. Yeah, it's quite a few. So if we just focus on that and see all the, all the front end data coming through the, uh, that's a, that's a share token for every single one of those. And we're still adding loopers. We're at number 40. You know what? Let's, let's kill that. So there's a hole in the code also. When we're in this initial uh, loop and we're adding loopers and we kill it, we're not going to, we didn't clean up anything. 
So now if I do a Xerox overview, you can see I've got, you can see that I've got a whole bunch of uh, shares sitting out there. So the easiest way for me to clean it up at the moment is I'm gonna do cat Xerox environment JSON, grab my Xerox token. And again, this is against my local development environment. So you can have that token all day long. It's not gonna help you at all. So we'll do a Xerox disable. You can see it's cleaning up all of those shares. And then we'll do a Xerox enable. So now we have a fresh environment. It's the quickest way to delete a large number of shares is just to disable your environment. Um, so that's, now we're cleaned up there. Uh, let's do that with a faster pacing time because that was very slow. So we try that again. We'll do a Xerox canary and we'll do pre-delay, min pre-delay, we'll say 200 milliseconds, max pre-delay one second. So we'll, we'll ramp them up a little and let's do rather than 128, let's try like, I don't know, 72. Get some action going here. You can see the load slowly ramping up on the CPU. A lot of activity on that front end. Now we're fully ramped up, running all of our work. And I would expect that we'll probably see number zero complete and number one, the number probably in some sort of order like that, we'll probably see. And it will depend, it'll be a little bit of a race depending on how the pacing delays randomly worked out between the various loopers. And this CPU, the, the load on this system, that's um, running my own ZD network and everything on this, this local machine. So it's pretty, pretty efficient. Just like the ZD that would, would be running in a production environment, all the crypto, all that sort of stuff. So now if I terminate this, it will go ahead and clean up all those shares. Cause I terminated it after, um, after the uh, list loopers were all created. So we did 1.7 gigabytes, 19 and a half megs, so nothing super fast. Let's change our pacing a little bit. So we'll say min pacing, 500 milliseconds, max pacing, one second. Let's see what that gets us. You can already see playing with these parameters gives you a very different load profile, changing the pacing, changing the payload sizes. Uh, you can do a lot of small payloads really fast. You can do big payloads really slow. It looks like they're already starting to finish. I should probably change this error to a warn. Every time I see that red error, it makes me think something bad happened. In that case, it's literally just the uh, listener stopping or closing. And they're more or less in increasing order, but not, not strictly. All right, 7,200 loops, 2.9 gigabytes, 113.2 megs per second. So you can see that's a, a 
Interesting way to generate lots of load, do lots of correctness testing. I don't expect that when we're doing production canary work that we're going to be doing massive amounts of load like this. But the, the goal of this canary is to be useful for the production uh, performance monitoring and management, but to also be useful as a set of system tests for, Z, for Xerox itself. Um, to, I, I expect that we'll probably add API testing and, and we'll, we'll start uh, keeping track of how what response times look like in environments and what they put some thresholds on them. So if they exceed those expectations that we kind of, you know, alarm on that and those sorts of things, the goal being that we want to drive performance up and quality up in the production Xerox environment as much as we possibly can. I think it's been 55 minutes and I know my brain's a little fady. So I think we're probably going to go ahead and wrap this one today. Let's see. What did I do differently? What did I change? Uh, yeah, added that pre-delay. And I may not even end up calling that pre-delay. We'll see. We'll see. But for now, we'll say, and that's all I did was add that one thing, pre-delay. Yep, okay. Um, all right. So I would expect that um, making good progress on 1.0, the agent UI stuff's coming along really well. Uh, the agent itself has been pretty solid. Um, let's take a look at the board while we're here. So we health check canary, this is actually a 0 0.4 feature. So I'm planning on putting out some version of this health checking canary in 0 0.4. Uh, so we can kind of get into production before the 1.0 release. If we look at the 1.0 release, um, still working on, adding some new things for around uh, auto ports where you can do in the, with the agent, you can do a, an access uh, and it will just automatically assign a port based on a, a range and, a, and available ports, some things like that. Um, piece of functionality that I need to implement for that agent to properly handle errors, auto port for new access, auto port for the, the actual HTTP listener for the agent. Uh, and I'm still, I think after the canary, the next big piece is going to be revamping the existing uh, Xerox console that's at api.xerox.io. That console, that's going to get a big, big facelift. Um, that's, uh, I've been using Vite with React for the new agent UI, and I really like that, that approach and that stack. So I expect I'll probably replace the old create React app stuff in the agent console, or the app, not the agent console, but the API console with the new Vite stuff. Um, I want to incorporate a mechanism for feedback, even if it just blasts it into the logs for now. It'd be nice to get some sort of user feedback from people. Um, we, we really are trying to drive quality up and find out what's what's working, what's not working for people. Um, go back to the epics. Still declarative sharing. Um, next generation share details. I think the the metadata around shares and things, are, it's going to get a lot more useful in 1.0. Um, more eight console stuff, more, uh, yeah, bunch, bunch of interesting stuff coming, but that's a, that's a little piece of, of Xerox office hours for you. Thank you. If, if you've made it this far, I really, I appreciate your time and attention. Um, and if you, if you've been, if you are a Xerox user, thank you so much. We, we really are trying to build a great product and, uh, and, and make everything better that we can make better. So thank you so much. And, uh, I'll see you in the next one of these. Have a good weekend. Bye. Actually, it's probably already been the weekend. This probably won't come out until yeah, it might come out. We'll see. If, if it's the if have a good weekend, whenever that might be for you. Take care.